Income tax 2023-2024. Child and dependent care expenses tax software example. Get ready and some coffee because tax preparation is like a choose your own adventure novel. Every choice leading to more pages of paperwork. Here we are. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product because... The fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com or in our form 1040 example problem using Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to software, it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov, standard starting point. We got Adam Taxman, just trying to avoid a dang tax man living in Beverly Hills 90210 starting with the single filing status no dependents nice even 100,000 of W2 income standard deduction for a single filer at the 13850 taking us to the taxable income 86150 which we can mirror in our income tax formula within Excel, 100,000, 13,850 standard deduction, the taxable income 86,150, tax calculated then by the software at 14,266, which we can see on page two of the form 1040. We're focusing now on the credits, specifically on the child independent care expenses credit, which will typically flow in possibly using form 2441, child independent care expenses form, which will flow into the schedule three, which will ultimately flow into page two here of the form 1040 line 20 amount from the schedule uh, three line eight. Here we have it. Now you'll note that these credits are up top in the taxes and credits section as opposed to in the payments section. Remember the general idea with the credits is that credits like deductions are typically good, but if I go back to page one, if we think about a deduction, that is typically going to be decreasing the taxable income. And when the taxable income goes down, then the, if we had a dollar of a deduction, we will get a benefit of that dollar dependent upon our tax rates and the brackets that we are going to be in. But if we got a full dollar of a credit, then we would be able to get a benefit of that full dollar, except that or in less the, we don't have any tax liability in order to consume that credit, at least with the credits up here, these are called the non-refundable credits because if we were to take the tax liability below zero we would no longer be talking about a tax system but a welfare benefit social safety net kind of system and then the credits that are down here you will also see credits down here like the earned income credit the additional child tax credit these are within the payments because you still get the dollar benefit of a dollar credit but you'll get that benefit even if the liability goes below the point of zero, which means that these credits are acting as basically a welfare and benefit type of program rather than a tax uh, kind of system in that case. So the credit we're focused in on is up here then in the non-refundable area amount from schedule three. Now it's gonna be linked to basically a child, which is usually going to be a dependent. So we're gonna be focused on the child and dependent care expenses credit but whenever we add a dependent, especially one that is a child, we can see multiple kind of impacts on the tax returns. Some of those impacts we are typically going to see is first, 
is the dependent going to be a qualifying child? If they are a qualifying child, do they qualify for the child tax credit? So the child tax credit, which we talked in detail about before, is typically going to be up here and possibly have a refundable portion for the additional child tax credit down below. That's one benefit of the child. If the income is below a certain threshold, it could also have a significant impact, the child, the dependent, on the earned income credit, which we talked about before. That typically be, once again, for lower income individuals. And then we also could have this benefit if there's going to be payments for child independent care expenses, which is a different type of credit, not to be confused with the child tax credit. And that's what we're focusing in on this time. Also, if I go back to page one, when we add the dependent, if we're starting from a single filing standpoint, then one dependent could move us up to head of household, which can have an impact on the standard deduction as well as the tax rates that are calculated on page two. So let's go ahead and do that first. Let's go ahead and just add one child that's gonna be qualifying for the child tax credit and see the impact there. And then we'll take the next incremental step, adding the child independent care expenses. Okay. All right, so now we have Adam Taxman has moved up from single status to head of household, which is typically the case if we have a dependent. Two dependents will not further benefit the filing status up top, but if you're not married, single is the worst filing status and the child or dependent will typically be needed to push someone up to the head of household. Then you would need to get married basically to go up another step in terms of filing status benefits, right? So then we have Sam Taxman is now on the books as a dependent son. And we have checked off that they qualify or he qualifies for uh, the child tax credit. Then the income is the same. We now have an increase, however, to the standard deduction went up to 20,800. Let's mirror that over here in our income tax formula. We've changed the standard deduction to a head of household. That brings us to the taxable income, 79,200. So I could see 79,200 page then number two, calculating the tax at 11,131. Let's mirror that over here. 11,131 is now gonna be the calculation. We also had a change in the brackets due to the fact that now we have a head of household versus the the single filing status and then the one that usually comes to mind the first thing that comes to mind is that child tax credit which is at the the uh, 2000 we looked at the worksheet related to it in prior presentations and and we don't have and we haven't added anything for the child independent care expenses because the income is high we don't have anything in the non-refundable credits down here for the additional child tax credit or the earned income tax credit. So let's just add that child tax credit over here. So I'm on other, other credits, child tax credit 2000, pulling that back on over to page one. So now we've got the 9131 on the tax. Is that correct? 9131 on the tax. All right, so that's gonna be our starting point there. Now, let's say that we have uh, child care for the child. Now, in prior presentations in the PowerPoints, we, we had long discussions about what qualifies for the uh, child care. But the general idea of the law is that we're hiring someone to take care of the child typically so that we can then work. That's why it's kind of characterized as a work-related expense. Remembering that for income taxes, you would think the kind of expenses that we would get to deduct are those expenses that helped us to generate revenue, which we can see most clearly on like the Schedule C, where we have business expenses that we needed to expend to generate revenue, therefore they're legitimate deductions. Kind of the argument here is this is like a business expense in that you're getting, you have to have someone take care of the child so that you can free up your time, so that you can go to work, and then instead of it taking the the look of an expense, it's gonna be then in the form of basically a credit. So what could that look like? Well, you might be paying uh, someone a, a center that you take the child to, that's one of the most common ways that you would see it, or possibly in like a preschool type of, of situation, but you also might have someone that comes to your home, in which case you gotta think about whether or not they're going to be uh, subject to like payroll taxes, uh, for example. 
So that's going to be the, the general idea. And the fact that basically it's supposed to free us up for work would mean that we would need some income up top in order to take the credit. So this is another one of those credits where it actually increases as income goes up to, up to a certain threshold and then it decreases basically back down again. Now this also has another quirk, this particular credit, because if when we go to married filing joint, then you have a situation like if I'm head of household, if we were a single person taking care of a child, then obviously if I'm working, I don't have the time to take care of the child and that would justify in the, in the eyes of the credit, the hiring of someone that might be qualified for a child independent care expenses to be part of the credit calculation. But if married, if only one person is working, then you would, the idea would be that the other person could take care of the child and therefore you wouldn't be able to get access to the credit in that case, unless like they're a student or they're incapable of taking care of the child. What does that mean for us with the data input? It means that we have to make sure that we assign the proper income to the married couple. So hopefully we'll have time to take a look at that, meaning uh, it, usually it doesn't make any difference from a federal income tax purposes who made the 100,000 if they were married. But for purposes of this credit, you have to determine that each spouse had income and, and therefore you, you got to make sure that when you do the data input that you're applying the proper amounts of income to the proper spouses so the software can basically properly calculate the credit. If you don't, it's not going to give you the credit because it's going to say that one of your spouses uh, is not working. Okay. All right, so now that we have the dependent in place in this data input screen for Lacert, it might look different depending on the software. I'm going to say there's our uh, Sam Taxman, which you would think normally would be a dependent. All the information related to Sam is pulling in. We're going to imagine that we paid qualified dependent care expenses of 5000 uh, for the benefit of Sam. And then if I go to who we paid to, we're going to need the name typically the address and the ID number. In this case, we're imagining that we paid some kind of external center as opposed to a care provider, in which case we have an EIN number as opposed to a social security number. And we're going to say that we paid the full 5,000 for the one child. Now that's going to be over the limit. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. If I go back on over, we now see that we have 2441. This is the child and dependent care expenses. So we have the child and dependent care expenses, part one, person or organizations who provided, who provided the care. So notice we've got the name, we've got the address, the number. If we can't get this information, we'd have to show that we did due diligence in order to get it because the IRS is going to say, hey, look, if you want a credit, it's just like in, an, in any other situation, right? Where you have an employee employer situation. If you're the employer, the IRS is going to say, do you want this tax benefit? You were going to say, yeah, we need that deduction for the wages expenses. Then they're going to say, give rat out who you gave the money to. I want their number. I want their address. I want their name so we can make sure that we get the tax from their side as income. Similar kind of thing here. The fact that we get a credit for this means that the IRS has leverage over us. Do you want the credit? Well, then you have to tell us who you who you gave the money to so that we can basically make sure on their end that they're reporting the income would be the general idea, right? So then we have the amount paid was 5,000 and then we have credit for child and dependent care expenses. So we have Sam, obviously the full 5,000, we're gonna say in this case was paid for Sam. Then we have line number one, add the amounts in column D line two. So enter more than 3,000 if you had one qualifying person. So we're limited to the 3,000. Uh, 6,000 if you had two or more persons. So notice if you go over two people, it's not gonna raise the cap over 6,000. So you have a cap of in essence, 3,000 to 6,000. Uh, although the allocation between the two people that you're paying for, it doesn't have to be allocated evenly. We'll talk about that shortly, possibly. Enter the earned income. So we have an earned income of the 100,000 pulling in from page number one. And then we have the enter the smaller of three, four, and five. So enter the line 11, there's our earned income. And now it's basically using this table to basically see the proportion of the 3,000. So we had 5,000 that we spent capped at 3,000, and then it's using an income threshold 
to see how much we're actually going to have to uh, get or we are going to be able to get. Let's pull out the trusty calculator here for some trusty calculations. So now we would just say, okay, within the table, we had 100,000. So that's going to be the 20% that it's capped at. So we're going to say, all right, 3,000 times the 0.2. That's going to give us our uh, 600 here. And then do, 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 we don't have any liability limit. This is basically the non-refundable portion, meaning it can't take our tax liability below zero. We have plenty of liability to consume it. So there's our 600 and uh, dependent care benefits nothing on page two for now, or part number three. And this has to do like if you if you got benefits through your work, that's going to have an impact on the credit calculation, which we might basically touch in on. All right, so that's going to go to schedule three additional credits and payments. We're on part one, the non-refundable credits. Line two, credit for child and dependent care expenses from form 2441. There's the 600, which is going to flow through to the form 1040, page number two. So there's our 600 uh, calculated here. So that's going to be the general idea. Now, again, obviously the income has an impact over here. So if I, if I go back on over and look at my table, so it's pretty low that it caps out at that, at that 20%. And then we don't see basically an upper cap above that. And then, and then $43,000 or less. So if we went down to like 30, so if we went down to like 31,000, let's say, then we have a bit higher of a percent. So let's go back on over here and say wages are, let's just say 30,000, 30,000 of wages, boom. So then if I go back to the form 1040, notice now we're at the 30,000, we've still got the 20,800 from uh, the head of household, which leaves us with 9,200 of the taxable income tax calculated is only 200, 923. So when we get to the lower income side of things, it gets messy because of course that 923 would be wiped out uh, by the uh, child tax credit, if nothing else, if we didn't have basically anything else. And the issue here is with the child tax credit, you have the non-refundable portion up top, and then you have the refundable portion for the additional child tax credit at uh, the 1,600. And then you've got this this amount for the expenses for the child care here. So notice what you'd like to be able to do then is because this bit for the expenses for the child care doesn't have any portion of it that's going to be the refundable portion. You'd like to take this one first so that you can take so you can consume any tax liability from it first and then consume the rest of it with the child tax credit on the non-refundable part and then have the additional child tax credit down here as well as any kind of earned income credit. So it gets the order of operations becomes kind of important in terms of how you're going to be if you're going to be able to maximize the benefit from the credits given the fact that they're all overlapping on each other. They're all dependent to some degree on the child and some of them have more or less of a benefit in terms of the non-refundable portion versus the refundable portion. And if you're talking about lower income people, then it's likely that you're going to hit a tax liability of zero and you have questions about how you can maximize then the refundable portion of the credit. So if I go back down to here, we've got the child at, we still have the 5,000, 3,000 is the cap, but now it's 27%. So that's where we came up with the 810. Notice that the liability is, is 923. So that full 810, we're getting the benefit from. So, so if I go to page number two, it's giving us the full amount of the 810, which is good because I want to take this one first because if they first gave me the child tax credit, then I wouldn't get any benefit here. So I'm getting the full benefit here. It's taking the difference of that 923 liability minus the 810 remaining 113 is being consumed by the child tax credit. And then so I'm getting the added benefit down here of the, the refundable portions of the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit. So it's kind of ordering the operations in such a way to basically maximize that, that, that interplay between the types of credits.
All right, let's bring it back to 100,000. 100,000 and go back on over. So, so now it's at that 600 again. For the, for, so we're at income of the 100,000. Let's say they, that he gets married. We have a married situation. So I'm going to go back on over and say, okay, now we're moving up to, to uh, head of household, married filing jointly. He's decided, hey, look, I'm tired of not being in a better tax bracket. I'm going to do the right thing and get married so that I can improve my tax situation. So that's how these decisions are made, you know. So now we've got a married couple. I'm just kidding. But now we've got a married couple. So now they're married. We still have uh, Sam Taxman. We're going to stay at the 100000 Now, this is where the interesting component is. We've got the 27700 for the standard deduction, which is an increase to married filing joint, bringing the taxable income to 72300 Page number two, calculating the tax, 8239 But you'll note, and we have the child tax credit still calculating, and now we don't have any earned income credit or anything because there's a tax liability. Nothing's being calculated for the additional expenses, though. Why? because we don't have any income on the spouse's side of things. So, and notice like in the software, if I was to say, okay, wait a sec, they both earned 50,000. Let's say we add a W-2 and we earned 50,000 here, duh, 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 and then 50,000 here. Notice if I don't check off the spouse box, then the IRS is gonna assume still that it's all applied to, to the spouse that's on the first of the tax return, right? That's how it's. That's how the tax system is set up, right? The first one is the taxpayer. The second one is going to be the spouse. So even though I enter two W twos, I still have the one hundred thousand, and the system can't tell that that fifty thousand of it was made by the other spouse, and therefore we're missing that bit. Now again, normally it wouldn't matter because you're one entity for taxes. So for federal income taxes, usually it would come out kind of like the same, to, no matter who earned the income, if they're married filing joint. But here, it's important to say this income was from the spouse, because then the system can say, oh, okay, well, that means that, that the spouse couldn't be home taking care of the kids and therefore justifying the expenses that you paid to take care of the kid. And now we've got the the form child independent care so there's the five thousand that was spent here there's the sam it's still capped at the three thousand and notice it doesn't increase this is one of the areas even on the higher income individuals where it's not giving like an added benefit for married married couples because you'd think maybe the the rate would change and these tables would change based on filing status but no so we're back to that same uh six thousand that's flowing through the schedule three that flows into page two here and there and uh, there we have it. Let's add another dependent. Okay, so we've added another kid in the system. I'm just going to call her tax benefit two. Uh, we call her TB2 for short. And so that's gonna, <laughs> that's going to be her. And then we're going to put her put this one on on the books and say, okay, so now we've got Sam. And then we have our TB2 benefit another 5,000 that we're paying for uh, the, her care. And we're going to say that we paid it to the same person. So we're imagining 5,000 spent for each kid going to the same external institution for a total of 10,000 going to one institution for the two kids. All right. So let's go back on over and say, all right. All right. I had her date of birth in incorrectly. She needs to be under 13 for the expenses to qualify. All right. Let's go back to the forms. Page number one. So now we have a married couple. So now they're married. So we have two kids, uh, 100,000. And then we still have the 27,700. Doesn't impact the filing, uh, the, the standard deduction for the second kid. So, so diminishing returns on these little buggers. But 72,300, if I go then to page two, we've got the tax calculated. And then the child tax credit bumps up to 400,000. So still some benefit. And then the amount from schedule three, line number eight, I'm totally kidding about the kids being a tax benefit, but we're going to go to 2441. So this is going to be the 
the institution we paid is the 10,000. Now we have two kids. We're going to allocate 5,000 to each of them, but it's capped at 6,000. You can think of it as 3,000 each, but we don't actually have to allocate the amount of 3,000 evenly between the two of them to still get the cap of 6,000, which we might take a look at shortly. And then we have the earned income. Notice the limit is 50,000, not 100,000, because it's looking at the limitation based on the earnings of each spouse, which both earned the 50,000. So this would be based on, I believe, the earnings of the lower income earning spouse, right? And then 6,000, 100,000, and then we still have the 20% calculation based on now 6,000 instead of 3,000 for a credit of 1,200. We don't have any liability limitation here. So we, we get the full amount that's going to schedule number three, and then that's going to the 1040 page number two, and there's uh, the 1,200 for that case. All right, let's imagine, notice that it's possible to say, okay, what if, if I go back to this one, we spent 10,000, 10,000 on, uh, on TB2, and on TB, on Sam, we had nothing, nothing was spent but I'm still gonna list Sam because Sam is a qualifying child. And so even, so you would think that I would be capped then to 3000 because we spent all of the money on TB2 and none of them on Sam. And you would think it'd be 3000 each, but because Sam is qualifying, that still brings the cap up to the 6,000. So if I go back on over, in other words, we're gonna say, okay, if I go to the 2441, so now we have 10,000 was spent still, and notice that zero was spent on one of the qualifying dependents, 10,000 on the other. So, but you still get the 6,000 as the amount, as the cap for the yearly cap. So we end up getting to the same benefit. So that's important to note if you have two qualifying children, even if you're not spending any money on one of them, you want to put them on the form uh, 2441 because they're going to raise the cap from 3000 to 6000 if you only have the two kids. What if I add another kid? What if I add tax benefit three? You can't call her tax benefit three or him because uh, you're not going to get as much of a tax benefit. All right, so just to demonstrate, we've got another kid now. So now we've got Sam and then we've got tax benefit kid number two that we spent 5,000 for, we're gonna imagine for childcare. And then we named this last kid diminishing returns. We call him DR for short. The DR kid uh, was a bit of a disappointment, but that's okay. We still love him, kind of. He still provides us some benefits. We're gonna go back and then let's go to the form 1040. So now we have married, we've got the three kids now. They all qualify for the child tax credit, doesn't impact the standard deduction or filing status, 72300 on the tax calculation, page number two. Here's the tax calculated, and then we have the child tax credit now boosting up for the three kids, 222 gives us to the six, but it doesn't impact this uh, added deduction. Let's go to this 2441, check out this calculation. For the child independent care expenses, we now spent 15,000. We're imagining we went back to a nice even between the three of them, uh, 5,000 between the three of them. You would think that if it was 3,000 per kid, then you would go three, six, nine, but no, it stops at two. So we're capped at two kids. That's why the third one is named diminishing returns, you know, but you know, whatever. So we end up with the same kind of calculation uh, down below. We try not to, we try not to, mention it too much that the kid is is not really pulling his weight as much as the as the prior ones you know it's just like but that's how it is you know all right so now let's imagine a situation where the one spouse is making the 100,000 again and the other one is not working so you will recall that if i go back on over page number 2 we're not getting any calculation for that credit because one of the spouses isn't working in that case. But if they were a full-time student, then possibly we can get some benefit from, from that. So I'm gonna say general information, and this is where we put this data input, will depend on your software. We're gonna say spouse disabled or full-time student. So if they were disabled or full-time student, we're gonna say for 12 months, I'm gonna say, and then pull back on over and then we're back to that 1200 if i go to the form 
Now we've got then, once again, I put it back to 10,000, 5,000 each for the two kids at uh, the 6,000. And there's our calculation based on that. All right, so now let's assume we have a similar situation going back to the scenario where we have two W-2s for the husband and wife, both earning the $50,000, making sure that we check off the spouse button so that the system can properly see the allocation between the two spouses. We're gonna imagine for the first spouse now that we have box 10 on the W-2 with $5,000 in it, representing a benefit for uh, dependent care benefits. Now, remember, if in an employer-employee situation, the employer would like to give money to the employee, which would go further, and they could do that if they can give money that's not subject to taxes. That's what the benefits typically are, the biggest one being like a 401k uh, situation. And in a 401k situation, typically box one of the W-2 is decreased, decreasing taxes for W-2 income that you might be familiar with. And then like box 12 is going to show the difference, the amount that was put into like a 401k plan or something like that. Similarly here, possibly we can have a situation where they can give money for dependent care benefits in order to allow it to work, possibly being able to reduce box one of the W-2. So we can imagine that in this case, they actually got paid benefits of 55,000, but box one is down to 50,000. You might see a difference also in box three and box five for Social Security and Medicare, depending on whether it's taxable for Social Security and Medicare. But we're not gonna get into that right now. We just wanna imagine the situation of, okay, look, I already got a tax benefit. I didn't get a credit for it. I basically got a deduction or an exclusion from income, which is basically equivalent to a deduction that's already taken care of on the W-2. So what does that do to my, my amount that I paid is still the same. I'm gonna imagine to the, to, to the, for, for the child benefits. So how do I calculate that over here in terms of my caps? So if I go to the form 1040, we're back to the 100,000, the 27,700 for the standard deduction, giving us the taxable income page two. We've got the 6,000 for the three children for the child tax credit. And we're calculating currently at the 2,000 for the other uh, credit for the expenses for the child care. So let's go to form 2441 to see how that plays out. We're still gonna say that 10,000 was paid, allocated now between two children. And notice it stops, it starts here, not at 6,000, but at 1,000. How did that happen? Well, if I go to page number two, this is coming into play now. This is dependent care benefits, where it says, enter the total amount of dependent care you received in 2023. Amounts you received as employee should be shown in box 10. So that's where the 5,000 is coming in. And so then we're gonna say, enter the total amount of qualified expenses incurred in 2023 for the care. We're gonna imagine here that we say it's the 10,000. We have the enter the smaller of the two, the, the uh, 5,000 earned income this is kind of like the limit which is 50,000 between the two employees both earning the 50,000 we took the smaller of the 5,000 so then it says here enter 5,000 uh, or 2,500 if married filing separately and you are required to enter your spouse's earned income however don't enter more than the maximum amount under the dependent care plan okay so it would be, it's capped out at that 5,000 which is what we put it in the plan and so then, so we have 5,000 here and 25 excluded benefits. If you check no, da, 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 there's the 5,000. So that's gonna take an impact on this part to claim the child and dependent care credit complete line 27 through 31, enter 3,000 or 6,000 if two or more qualifying persons. We have the 6,000 and 5,000 is being pulled in from up above. We already got a benefit from it and therefore we only get 1000 of added benefit is basically the bottom line which is what's pulling through to page 1 here of the form now we're down to 1000 instead of the 6000 cuz we already got a benefit of the 5000 not in the form of a credit but rather in essence like a deduction which was done by the employer by reducing line 1 or box 1 of the W2 right so now we go through this calculation we're taking basically 20% of that 1,000, we have the liability to cover it, and that's how they're getting to that $2,000 amount. Now, notice this gets a little bit tricky when you're trying to think about, well, would it be worthwhile to get a benefit program 
through my employer because really obviously the deduction is typically going to be i mean a credit is usually more beneficial if it was a dollar credit versus a dollar deduction right but you're not getting a dollar credit for every dollar you spend you're only getting like 20 percent if your income is above the forty-three thousand. so so in that case depending on your tax brackets you might be better off getting the deduction through your employer reducing the w-2 uh, if you can get that up to the maximum, which might be like $5,000 for the two kids or possibly like $3,000 for the one for the one kids, you would think, right? And then if you have more expenses above and beyond that, then then you can basically uh, take cut into the, the 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 credit amount. So so you would think then it might still be beneficial to to first take advantage of the benefits if you can get those benefits through the employer and then take any added benefits up and above that given the fact that the credit is severely limited for people over like 43,000 would might be like the general idea now note what would happen if the spouse wasn't working here let's say we didn't have the spouse working and we go back to the 100,000 up top then then uh we're going to say well now they don't qualify for the credit and you you paid into this benefit program in box 10 and you'd have to basically include it in income because now they gave you they reduced box one by an amount for child tax benefits but you can't get the benefits because the childs don't qualify because the spouse isn't working and then you'd have to possibly not only not get the credit but possibly include it you know in income in that situation so that's the general idea for the credit just remember when we're when we're adding uh the a child then uh, or a dependent the series of questions that we typically end up going through are do they qualify for a dependent if they qualify for a dependent are they a qualifying child if they're a qualifying child do we get the child tax credit which is the big one which could have both a refundable and non-refundable component to them depending on the income level and then two if their income is low is that going to have an impact on the earned income credit if their income is high then they also might have the added uh, expenses for the caring for the child which uh, could possibly be deductible remembering that that is mainly going to be the non-refundable component of the credit and the child if we're thinking about a single child if they move up from single to head of household then it could affect the filing status, which has an impact on the standard deduction and possibly the tax rate calculations on page two. And when we're thinking about this particular credit for expenses to care for the child, the general gist of the credit is that you, you, you're doing it in order to free someone up to work and therefore you would need an, an earned income element in, in order to do that. And if married, then you're gonna have some concern about both of the individuals having some kind of earned income generally in order to claim the credit which means that you have to be careful to make sure that you are properly allocating the w-2s and other income sources between the spouses properly noting remember that that a schedule c also uh would be income that that would apply as well uh and that leads to incentives sometimes for people to try to say like if you were to say okay wait a second the spouse doesn't have any income let's say we had one hundred thousand for one one spouse and then and then nothing here and then the second spouse didn't have any income well you might say okay well i can just add you know a schedule c because maybe she or she has a hobby or something that we could call schedule schedule c income remember it has to be legitimate income in order to basically include it uh and also th there's some discouragement between of people just trying to add like schedule c income in order to basically try to get possibly like an earned income credit or part of the, this uh credit because if you add if you add schedule c income it will be subject not only to federal income taxes but social security uh and medicare but just keep in mind that when we're talking about earned income doesn't necessarily have to be the W-2 income.